I'm Kathy Miller. I'm from Beaver, Pennsylvania. Uh, one day I was accidentally walking by the Navy recruiter's office, and thus that began my career in the U.S. Navy. This was 1971. Okay. It was the year when women did not join the military. <laughs> in those days, it, it was a man's Navy. But things have changed a lot. Now I heard that the military has 20 to 40 percent of women enlisted and officer. Well, uh, it was an accident, and I talked to the Navy, and he said, well, you have a degree, so I could make you an officer. I didn't know the difference then. And he said, uh, with your degree, we could send you to Newport, Rhode Island and, and have a commissioning ceremony for you. And I said, okay. So I ended up signing for three years, and off I went to Newport, Rhode Island, and it was about two and a half months of rigorous basic training in officer candidate school. It was in the olden days when the men and women were still separate, so we had all separate training for the women. Well, it was very rigorous. You know, Newport, Rhode Island is known for very cold weather, and we were marching in February, and we were marching outside in the cold weather. And it, I thought it was very difficult. And the shoes that they gave us, we had to spit shine them, and they were very ugly shoes. <laughs> and we had to march in those shoes in the very cold weather. The, you get used to it. I didn't like the watches in the middle of the night from 2.30 a.m. to 4.30 a.m. But then again, you get used to everything. The, the lectures were rigorous. Everything was different. Had to learn military time all military subjects, and it was tricky trying to learn all of those things. Um, everybody had a hard time with the watches in the middle of the night. <laughs> and then you had inspections. Uh, there were two girls in every room, and the, the captain, or well, it's a Navy lieutenant, full lieutenant came around once a week with the inspection, and she had white gloves, and everything had to be perfect. The sheets had to have square corners, no dust. I mean, she would take her white gloves and go by, and everything had to be perfect. Otherwise, you got a gig. If something was really bad, you got a demerit, and you had to make up this punishment with watches or marching or different things. So you made sure everything was in perfect condition when the inspector came around. Things were different. Women's training was a little bit lighter than men's. Uh, we did not have any shooting with guns then. Now that's all different. We did have uh, PE, but we didn't have those hard push-ups that the men do. And that was because, well, supposedly, and this is true, women's upper arm strength is different than men's, so some of the things that women had to do were different than men. And that was one of the reasons there were no women pilots until the early 70s when I was in. And then they decided that they could compensate for the lack of upper arm strength for women. And they, the first uh, Navy women pilots came through the Navy in the years when I was there. Let's see, my first duty station was Naval Air Station Corpus Christi, Texas at a fixed-wing propeller squadron. And there were 500 men in the squadron and three women. Now that sounds glorious for the women, but it wasn't. It was, sometimes I felt as if I just came from another planet, you know, because when you're, the odds are like that. But, you know, everybody did his job, and nobody gave me a hard time. My, my first, one of my first jobs was a maintenance officer in an aircraft propeller squadron. And they sent me to many schools, so I learned what I had to do. And everybody was pretty cooperative because you had to be. You're in the military. So I did not do the actual maintenance. I scheduled the S-2 aircraft for maintenance checks. So I did a lot of scheduling of maintenance, and I work with the, the enlisted people and the chiefs 
on what things were going on with the S-2 aircraft. And, and I learned all about aircraft parts and paid for ordering of parts. But it was an interesting job. <laughs> um, I was in Corpus Christi for two years. And then I asked to go to the West Coast. And the Navy sent me to the west coast of Africa, to Canitra, Morocco, <laughs> which was a surprise. Morocco was very interesting. Uh, when I first arrived, uh, I arrived at Casablanca Airport. This was 1974. And I heard the rumble of Arabic all around me. And then I got off the airplane, and a big yellow bus met a group of us who were going to the bases. And he said, welcome, my name's Petty Officer Second Class White, and welcome to Casablanca. Nobody calls it Casablanca here, we call it Darbeda. And the trip from Darbeda to Canitra, where you're going, or you could go to the Marine Base at Sidi Aia or a Marine Base at Buknadel. The trip to those three places, approximately two hours, and we're going to secret communication bases, and just remember, you're not really here. <laughs> so while, while I was on the bus, I looked out the window and I saw all kinds of things. I saw camels walking by, and a shepherd with his flock, and a stop sign in Arabic, and um, a, a village surrounded by greenery. And then the stark reality hit me that I was a foreigner in a strange country and I did not know the language. So it was that day I decided I better learn the language so I could understand the Oriental mind. So my first trip off the base was to meet my prospective Arabic teacher. And I drove from Kenitra on the base to the town, which is about two miles. And I got lost when I got to the town and I tried to to find my way. So I asked the first man in English, do you, do you know where Hassan Second Avenue is? And he looked at me and said, Muffemsh Inglesia. And I said, uh-oh. So then I asked the ne next person, do you know where Hassan Second Street is? And he said, Muffemsh Inglesia. Then the third person I asked, and he responded in French, and I don't understand any French. And he was telling me, but I didn't know. I don't understand English, and he was saying it in French. So I decided I better get busy because I did not find her house that time, and I was only one block away from her house. But later, after I could speak a little bit, I was invited to her house many times and enjoyed many great dinners at her house. It took me about six months to learn some Arabic, and it was difficult just to say the H's, they have three H's in Arabic, and just to say, ha, huh, <sighs> took months to learn that. And finally, I started going to the markets and I spoke a little bit of Arabic. And there was a complete change. When I first got there, they called me Nazraniya, or Christian foreigner. And after I started speaking with everyone, they called me Leila, which is a respectful term for man. And after I started speaking, everything changed. Uh, it was like an explosion in my head. I could understand all those guttural sounds. And everybody was so kind to me. And they talked to me and they told me all kinds of interesting stories. I, I, I uh, taught English at a, at a little school about... 10 minutes from, from the base. We had a joint Arab-American base. And I would take, had an MGB, which was the complete wrong car for Morocco because it's too low. And when stones hit the mufflers, uh, they make hole in the mufflers. And my mother used to send me mufflers all the time to the fleet post office. But anyway, on the way, on the way to English school, I taught English at an Air Force English school called the Defense Language Institute. And I taught uh, Moroccan soldiers and pilots how to speak English. The reason we were doing that is uh, the American government was teaching these people how to fly the C-130 or C-131 aircraft and 
All the directions were in English. Anyway, on the way to English school, I passed walled villages, many walled villages, and houses with walls all around. And these are high walls. It's not like our houses. Their houses are hidden behind walls. So finally one day I went inside of the walls and I found wonderful cities teeming with life and excitement. Or I was invited into the houses behind the walls and I saw beautiful gardens with water. And water to a Moroccan means abundance. So anyway, I started meeting people too on the way to the school because I stopped to get a coffee or whatever and I met uh, women too. The women had something in common with the walled cities. They were covered, but not excessively. And they were, they were very friendly. So one day I met a, a very pretty Moroccan girl and I said to her, what is that metal around your neck? By then we were talking to each other in Arabic. And she said, that is um, Mary, or Miriam. She said, that's Miriam, you call her Mary. Um, she said, she's the mother of a great prophet. Now this is the view, their view. And she said, do you know him? I said, yes, I know him. And then she told me, she said, every day, we have an ancient saying that every day we must perform a charity and be kind to another and remove a harmful object from the road or help a, a man with his mount or a charity. Every step to prayers is a charity or a smile is a charity. And I said, look at this young woman, a very wise woman. So then I met another young girl. She was a mother. She said, I just had my baby. And the Moroccan government gave me one year of paid maternity leave. And I was surprised because this was 1974. And she said, we are encouraged to ed educate ourselves and to seek knowledge as far as China. And she said, did you know the first university and oldest university in the world is in Fez, Morocco, and it was founded by two Moroccan sisters. And I said, oh my goodness. So then I met some more people, uh, or, you know, surrounded by my teaching. And I met this one young man and he said, in Morocco, uh, the Muslims and the Jews have lived peacefully for 2,500 years since the Jews moved here from the Roman Empire. I said, no, I didn't know that. Uh, then I met another man. I met a black Arab, and the black Arabs came from Sudan and New Guinea and Nigeria. And what I liked about Morocco, you, I would see uh, what I would consider a black man walking arm in arm with what I would consider a white man. I thought that they were colorblind, and I liked that a lot. So, you know, this was all a positive influence on my teaching, too. But this, my students were very, very good. They already knew classical Arabic, Moroccan dialect of Arabic, and French. So when they got to me, it was their fourth language, and they were great scholars of English. But the, the customs were very different. Um, they used henna on the hands, and I had my hand painted. And in Morocco, when I extended my hand, everybody said, oh, how beautiful your hand is. And then when I went back to the United States and handed the guard in New York my passport, he said, oh, lady, what happened? Hey, lady, what happened to your hand? Did you cut your hand? So you see the cultural difference. And then uh, I loved the food, couscous, sitting around a circular table, eating with the right hand, very delicious food. And... Um, then when I left Morocco, I was sad. I felt like uh, as if I were on the western fringe uh, of reality. And I used to long for the arches of eastern solitude. Then many years later, like I, I was in Morocco till 77. And in the year 2000, I met my Moroccan husband, which was another accident <laughs> and a very good accident. Um, I learned a lot being in the Navy. Uh, I learned that uh, the Vietnam War was a serious business because many of the pilots we trained in that S-2 squadron did not come back, and they were young, energetic men. 
I was kind of young and frivolous when I joined the military, but you know, you soon learn the reality, what's going on. And, and there's a war and people were injured. They didn't know about Agent Orange then. And many people to this day, the grandchildren of the veterans were injured from Agent Orange and suffer from heart problems, kidney, liver problems, all kinds of problems. You didn't, I didn't know any of that. I, um, I didn't know, I mean, supposedly, and this is true, 59,000 men and women died in Vietnam. And I didn't know about the other side. One time my husband said, well, how many Vietnamese died? And at least 400,000, maybe more, because there aren't even any records. So war is a terrible thing for everybody. And I learned a lot of good things in the military. But I, I also saw the world from Morocco, which was fabulous. And you can never replace all the things you learn from traveling or from living in another culture. It's absolutely fabulous. And one thing you learn is that your ways are not necessarily the best ways. And even if something is done completely differently in another culture, it works. So you, you have to broaden your horizons, which, I mean, you can't help it. You learn, you learn about many things traveling. There are, even though drugs are illegal in Morocco, there are a lot of drugs there, and people could get in some big trouble. For example, in Marrakesh, you could buy any kind of drug you want, and some uh, naive enlisted people, E2s, bought some keef, that's kind of a strong version of marijuana, which is illegal in Morocco. And one E2 ended up with a seven year jail sentence in Morocco, and he served it. So you had to be very careful about drugs. Wow. And uh, oh, also, uh, you know, it's a different culture. Theoretically, uh, premarital sex is outlawed in Morocco. However, there was another E2 that had got involved with a Moroccan woman and also impregnated the girl. And her father was after him when he found out about it. And one night, we did not have night flights on the base, and one night I heard the engine revving up, and I said, what's going on here? We don't have night flights. Well, what happened is this E2 was in big trouble, and the father was after the guy with the sword, and he was going to kill the guy. And the CO of the base found out, and he, he rescued him, put him in the plane, and sent him right up to row to Spain. So the girl left the country, because you can't have a baby outside of wedlock in Morocco, and the the enlisted guy got a dishonorable discharge. So, you know, those are two things. Don't mess around with women and drugs if you're in Morocco. <laughs> but, I mean, it's a very conservative culture. It is a Muslim culture, but as far as Muslim cultures, it's very liberated. But there are certain limits, and you shouldn't go outside of those limits. Any, any space available American plane that came into Ganitra, I could jump on for free. I went all over Europe, part of Asia, oh, just every place, Middle East, every place. My, one of my favorite trips, I got a space available flight to Athens, took the Orient Express trip to Istanbul, uh, took a regular flight to Cairo, a flight back to Athens, and a space available flight back to Morocco. So I called it my big triangle. I mean, nowadays, I don't know if you could do all that because of all the threats involved. But in the 70s, everybody was in a peaceful situation, and everybody liked Americans, especially American tourists. So you could go all over the place. I later went to China and Thailand, and the islands in the Caribbean, I'm some parts of South America. I mean, I've been everywhere, <laughs> which I thought was glorious. <laughs>
You know, while I was in Morocco, we were far removed from that. I really didn't think about it very much. One interesting thing, in the 70s, the women's liberation movement happened in the United States, and I was in Africa. I had no idea what that was or what it meant. And when I came back, I found out. In some ways it was good, some ways, you know, it was a failure, I, in my opinion. But no, I was so far removed from that, I never thought about. But I saw firsthand in Corpus Christi about the Vietnam War and about how about half a dozen of my friends didn't come back. And one day I went over, I was at Naval Air Facility, but the Aradmac Army Facility was next door and there were helicopters in there. I had to go over there for some reason. And I walked by the helicopters and there was blood on, on the outside. So, you know, that left an impression, and I peeked in the helicopter, and there was blood on the inside, too. And I said, yeah, this is a war. This is serious business going on. It was Memorial Day, my first year in the Navy, and I, I went to a ceremony, and I sat next to this beautiful young woman. I couldn't figure out what she was doing there. So I started talking to her, and she says, oh, yeah, Part of this ceremony is to honor my husband. She said he didn't come back, he was a pilot. I said, oh. So she had two children. I found out later, thankfully, she married another pilot and he adopted her children. So that one had a happy ending. But yes, there were things like that that happened all around. So I became aware of what was going on. It wasn't difficult, but it was challenging. I was a teacher, an English teacher, and it was different. But one thing I liked, uh, the students were very enthusiastic about learning. And I didn't quite understand why they were so enthusiastic. And then they told me, well, we need this because we have to have English to have our jobs. Also, if we do not learn English, we don't progress in our ranks. I said, oh, okay. And um, it was a big disgrace. I don't think anybody flunked out because they had to learn. Um, and the pilots had to learn English, or otherwise they, they could not become pilots. So it was challenging because, some, you know, some, the, some classes were rock bar, bottom English. So it's very challenging to teach a new language to somebody who never heard that language. But one good thing, most of them already had French, and French is Latin-based, so French has a lot in common with English. Arabic, on the other hand, is written right to left, completely opposite direction, and the vowels are on top and of the letters and below the letters. Can you imagine? And so I noticed the writing skills of Arabs, oh, not so good. And it takes them a long time to learn how to write. One good thing about Arabic, though, it's, it's basically a phonetic language. So if, if you say, say it and you see it, that's the way it is. It's the same. In English, however, the written English is so different than the oral English. So they did have a lot of trouble sometimes. They'll say, well, why, why is this like this in English? That's not the way it sounds. In Arabic, the way we say it, that's the way it is. So they did have some difficulties with English. But most of them did very well. Oh, I developed a close friendship with my Arabic teacher. And her name was Hadija. And, um, she was a very good teacher. In the olden days, we learned, if you were an English speaker, you learned uh, how to speak English with phonetics, which I don't know if that's the best way to learn how to do Arabic. Now I'm studying written Arabic, and it makes a lot more sense just to learn the way you speak it and to write it at the same time. But anyway, she was very patient, and she taught me how to speak Arabic. 
And but when you learn a language, you just don't learn, you don't learn just the language. You learn all the things around the language. Like I learned the customs from her. Um, just every interesting thing about Morocco, I learned from her when we studied together. She was a native of Kenitra, and she was a young married woman when I met her, and she had one child, and she wanted to get closer to Americans. And she was a teacher. She liked her job very much. But we became good friends. We used to go to different places together. I met her family. Uh, it was really a very good experience knowing her. I met her, her mother one time. I used to stay overnight because my husband then was a Navy pilot who passed. But he was away a lot. And so I used to stay at her house or her mother's house sometimes. And I remember one time, and her mother didn't speak one word of English. And one time I was staying at her mother's house and her mother said to me, uh, here, you sleep over here. And she tucked me in and gave me a kiss. I mean, you know, just like a mother. It was just great. And I shared all kinds of marvelous meals at both the teacher's house and her mother's house. And we used to sit a, around a big round table and eat all kinds of wonderful dishes with the right hand. So the left hand, by the way, is for the toilet. <laughs> anyway, it was, it was very nice. Um, knowing that family, very nice. And I met, she had, a, she had two other sisters, um, and I, Bushra and uh, Hadija, and we used to go to different places together. So it was like having a built-in built tour guide, I guess. <laughs> it does open up. If you can speak even a few words, everything changes. All the prices go down, way down. <laughs> I mean, the Americans used to get angry with me about the prices that I paid for things, so I stopped discussing prices. Because I would pay uh, like a quarter and they would pay a dollar for the same thing. So that big, big difference in prices, but not only that, well, they were nice to the tourists, but if you lived there and they knew Oh my, you got the royal treatment. Uh, for example, my parents came to Morocco in 1976. And I took my mother, who's a, who was a very little woman, about 90 pounds, and th very thin little woman. And I took her with me to the markets. And they have a high opinion of mothers in the family. So I took every place that I took her, I said, this is my mother, and this is Mohammed, or this is Ahmed, or what. Every place where we went, somebody gave her a present. I couldn't believe it. She went back with an armful of presents. She said, these people are really nice. She said, well, they like mothers here. And we went to the veg vegetable market. Somebody gave her some beets. Somebody gave her bananas. Each one gave her something. So I thought that was very, very nice. But see, like you said, the culture opened up. If you're a tourist, you know, you're a tourist American, like I said, all the prices are up. Everybody's polite, but it's different. All right, here's something that was very funny. The little children get after you all the time and follow you around, or sometimes they, they want a piece of candy or a quarter, it's a Durham. Oh, I said to my Arabic teacher, I want to get rid of them. She said, no problem, just say sir fahelik. Okay, what that means, it's a very funny expression, and it's only a local Moroccan expression. It means, go get yourself gone. It's a very funny, it's not insulting, but it's kind of funny. And so I said that, and then the little kids looked at me and said, oh, how do you know that? So everybody went away, and they went, went away laughing because it's a very funny expression. So I had the, the insider's expressions there. But that, that was very nice too. <laughs> so it was really my second home. And I stayed on after I got out of the Navy too. And I worked only at Moroccan schools, not even with the DLI schools anymore, just straight Moroccan schools. So I really 
really got an inside picture of everything. Oh, I almost went native. <laughs> when I came back to the States, this is very interesting. Uh, English, English in Pittsburgh sounded like little birds warbling. Just say, see, because you get used to all those guttural sounds, and then all of a sudden you hear, and that was the majority of time I heard Arabic. And then I came back and I said, oh my, this sounds so different. Uh, my, my mother met me at the airport and I said that to her. She says, oh my goodness, what has happened to you? And I said, well, you know, it just sounds different. And everybody, oh, this is funny. Moroccans are tanned and they have high cheekbones and thin noses. And I was used to seeing everybody tanned. And I came back here and I said to my mother, everybody looks so pale. <laughs> See, but I had been there four years. I became very open-minded. And uh, I was surprised when I came back, somebody made a derogatory comment about Muslims. I said, I didn't find that so at all. They were very nice to me, very kind. Uh, I saw many different cultures, cultures traveling. And like I said, I found that just because somebody did it in a different way doesn't mean it's the wrong way. Uh, in Turkey or Egypt or Morocco or in Europe too, they do things differently than we do. But you find out that other people's ways work. Uh, I became very open-minded. Then I came back here and somebody would say something like, do, do Moroccans wear shoes? I said, oh, come on. Of course they wear shoes. I mean, those were some of the comments I got uh, when I came back. Or, oh, do Moroccans have bathrooms? Somebody asked me. I said, of course they have bathrooms. And somebody said, do Moroccans have tigers? No, no tigers in Morocco. I, mean, I was surprised when I returned about some of the questions that I got. And these were from people with college degrees, too. I think we have a very negative view of Muslims, but our media uh, sends that message. And I think we have a negative view of Muslim Americans, too. Uh, Stephen Jobs, the founder of Apple, uh, has a Syrian Muslim father. And, you know, according to some politicians, then he wouldn't even be allowed in the United States. So, I don't know. Uh, I think that we need to sit down and talk with people more and gain a better understanding of different religions. I mean, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity. I think we can all live peacefully together if we sit down and talk to each other. What I found out after living in a Muslim country all those years, uh, Muslims have more in common with Christians than we would ever imagine. And yes, there are differences, but they're not such terrible differences. I mean, I told you about that saying, the ancient saying, that's called a hadith, and that's right out of Islam, and we have the golden rule in Christianity, so those are the same. And a lot of the Old Testament is right in the Koran. So we have many things in common. Right? We just have to sit down and talk about things and understand each other. I was married to a Navy pilot who passed. And in the olden days, they didn't particularly keep couples together. They were going to send him to Corpus Christi and me to Africa. I said, oh, no, we're not. So uh, I got out soon afterwards, after I heard about that. Because I was a newlywed, and I didn't want to live so far from my husband. <laughs> But if I had to do it over again, I would have probably stayed in longer. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. there, there are advantages to having a military retirement. <laughs> I found that civilians had no clue about the military and 
like one of my one of my assignments was a public relations officer and and also a maintenance officer and I used to go to apply for jobs as a public affairs officer and they said well we don't understand the relationship between that and the civilian world and the military and there's a direct relationship it's the same thing so they didn't understand exactly about uh, my experience. So that was a little bit difficult. Um, and, you know, people would ask me, well, why in the world did you join the Navy? They, they couldn't fathom that, because in those years, women didn't. I said, well, it was just an accident. <laughs> but, and then it was during the Vietnam War, too, and that that war had a very unfavorable opinion with most Americans. So it wasn't until many years later that people appreciated veterans that were in that war and then thanked us for our service. Um, I had been sick and one day I was riding the veteran's van to the VA hospital in Pittsburgh and Jerry Fisher told me, he said, you need to get out of the house and be a veteran and join some of our organizations. And that was very good that he did that because I had been in the house for five months and it opened a lot of doors. I met very interesting people at the VVA 862 meetings. I also joined the Disabled Veterans 107 and I met a lot of very kind, interesting people at those meetings, people who did a lot of charitable work and helped others. I also went to Veterans Breakfast and I enjoyed myself a lot met all kinds of interesting people from World War II veterans, Korean veterans, um, Vietnam veterans. I met some of the newer fellows too from Iraq and Iraq veterans. And um, oh, I got to be in parades and rallies and those were all fun. And it was very interesting because the first parade that I participated in. I got to ride in a red convertible, which I loved. And uh, I, the people on the sides in the audience of the parade were so positive and yelling and cheering and saying thank you. And it was totally different from the 70s when we came back and people didn't even like us for being in the military. And it, it was very heartwarming to have that kind of response from people that I knew and lots of people on the sidelines. So I have enjoyed doing my veterans activities and talking and, and I'm, now I'm doing some PR work with the newspapers with VVA 862 and I wrote some things that they put in the newsletter in the Disabled Veterans 107 newsletter. So I have enjoyed those things.